I would like to introduce, introduce Ruth Edmonds Hill, who comes from Cambridge today. She is coordinator of oral history projects for the Schlesinger Library, Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. Among some of the projects she has worked on there over, the, over more than 20 years include the Black Women Oral History Project, Women in Federal Government, the National Organization for Women, and currently Chinese American Women Oral History Project. She's presented lectures and workshops for many venues in the United States and abroad, was a producer of a storytelling event for Lincoln Center Out of Doors. She's organized 10 years of travels for Women of Courage, a photographic ex exhibition based on black women oral history project. And we have a book over on the table uh, that shows that project. She's been a longtime member of Oral History Association and served on many committees and on the editorial board of the Oral History Review. She's contributed to a number of journals, including Radcliffe Quarterly, Notable Black American Women and African American National Biography. She has quite an extensive biography, and this is just a little snippet of the work that she has done over time, the amazing work she has done for women, for our society, for our world. And Brother Blue's quote uh, helps to contribute to the snippet I offered you. In my questions to Ruth, one of the things I asked her about was in addition to her biography, her work experience, um, her memories on things, I asked Ruth uh, the question, if you could tell me something that we don't know as much about you with all of this biography. Well, you do know now. <laughs> but the things that always surprise me, I would be on the street with Brother Blue and in Cambridge and Boston area, and people thought, Oh, she's with Brother Blue. So I had the name Mrs. Blue, Lady Blue, <laughs> Sister, Mother Blue. And so it was a shock to everyone to find out that I really had a career of my own that no one knew about. <laughs> so today, what I decided to do was, since this year is the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, I want to tell you about the life of my great-grandfather. He was chaplain of the Massachusetts 54th Regiment in the Civil War. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit about his life. And then I have, he wrote several books. And I have a couple of the original things here. And I'm going to be reading a little bit, some excerpts, just to uh, fill out the time, so to speak. <laughs> So his name was Samuel Harrison, and he was born April 15, 1818, in Philadelphia. His parents were William and Jenny Harrison, slaves of uh, John Bolton of Savannah, Georgia, but he had family also in Philadelphia. So his mother, Samuel Harrison's mother, was a waiting maid uh, with uh, Sarah Bolton in Philadelphia at the time of his birth. So in 1821, his widowed mother was freed, and they moved to New York City with the Boltons, and she actually worked as a servant in that family. He also eventually attended school there. When he was eight or nine years old, his mother sent him to Philadelphia to get him away from an uh, abusive stepfather, and also to become apprentice to an uncle who was both a shoemaker and a minister. And his mother later left uh, her uh, husband and moved to Philadelphia. In 1835, when he was 17 years old, he decided he wanted to get more education. He wanted to become a minister. So he worked in the shoe shop in the morning and went to school in the afternoon. No, I think it was the other way around. Went to school in the morning. Then he worked in the shoe shop in the afternoon. He got his education done. In 1836, with the help of the American Education Society, he went to a school called Manual uh, Training, Manual Labor School, which was in Peterborough, New York. It had been founded in 1834 by uh, Garrett Smith. He was a philanthropist and a prominent abolitionist. And he offered a classical education in return for four hours of daily work. 
So although the school closed in 1836, Harrison was able to continue his education, and he went to preparatory school of Western Reserve College in Hudson, New York. And he studied Greek, Latin, philosophy, and theology there, and he also took a job, again, as a shoemaker to help pay his way. He graduated in 1839 and for some reason decided not to go on to college. I'm not sure just what. I have his autobiography here, but he doesn't really explain why he didn't go on. In 1840, he married Ellen Rose, who had been a slave in Delaware and whom he had known when he was a teenager. And they had 13 children. And I, somewhere along the line, one of my relatives listed, found, got all the names together like this. And of the 13 children, only about five of them grew up. They all died when they were young. And I also have a picture of four of the children. And I have no idea where this came from and how I got it, but I'm glad that I do have it. <laughs> so in June of 1847, uh, Reverend E.P. Rogers, who had been a classmate at uh, Garrett Smith School, invited him to move to New, New Jersey. So Harrison moved and became an assistant to Rogers, and he studied theology and also did missionary work. And in 1848, he was licensed to preach. In the fall of 1849, Rogers arranged for him to meet the parishioners of a new eight-member church in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. In January of 1850, he moved to Pittsfield, became the pastor of the Second Congregational Church. In August, the uh, Berkshire Association of Congregational Churches ordained him. He continued his ministry there until 1862 when some dissension occurred in the church and he resigned. He became a spokesperson for the National Freedmen's Relief Association, which was raising funds to assist the uh, uh, freed blacks in the Sea Islands of South Carolina. In July 1863, Governor John Andrews of Massachusetts asked Harrison to go to South Carolina. The 54th Massachusetts Volunteers had lost nearly half its members, also its leader, Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, in a battle at Fort Wagner. And the governor wished to, wished to send some expression of sympathy of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to the remaining members of the regiment. And later in the year, through the recommendation of Dr. Mark, Mark Hopkins of Williams College, uh, Andrew appointed Harrison chaplain of the Massachusetts 54th Regiment. And in South Carolina with the soldiers, he celebrated the first anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, which had been given on January 1, 1863. He expected that he'd be treated like all the chaplains, but learned otherwise when payday came. And this was true also of the enlisted men. And Harrison and the men refused to accept any pay unless they were going to receive the same pay as the white soldiers. So Colonel Shaw at some point had written to Governor Andrew requesting that black men be paid the same as white soldiers. In 1864, an Army Appropriations Bill was passed and requiring retroactive pay for all black soldiers who had served in the Union Army. Governor Andrew wrote to President Lincoln about Harrison's situation, explaining that he'd been commissioned with the understanding that he would be treated as the white chaplains. And eventually, Attorney General, Governor, uh, Attorney General, sorry, Attorney General Edward Bates wrote to the President that Harrison all, and all black chaplains should have received full pay. After his discharge, uh, Harrison served as pastor in congregational churches in Newport, Rhode Island, Springfield, Massachusetts, and Portland, Maine. In 1872, he received a letter from the Second Congreg Congregational Church in Pitts Hill asking him to return, accepted, and remained there until his death on August 11, uh, 1900. So it's been difficult to know what to read from the works that he uh, Wrote, and I think I've managed to find some interesting things for you. So there's one publication called Pittsfield 25 years ago, and it was a sermon that he gave in Pitts at the Second Congregational Church in January and um, 11th and 18th of 1874. Now we deal with the small print. Mm -hmm. 
So he says, Pittsfield ratified those peace measures, the effect of which was to drive from our town some who came from the south. They had looked upon these ranges of mountains as sure defenses from the slave hunters. But in this garden of God, they found no rest for the soles of their feet. At this time, an incident occurred worth narrating. The colored people had called a meeting of their own, even in this building, at which meeting we pledged ourselves that no fugitive slaves should be taken from this town without resistance. A committee was appointed to take charge of this matter and also to see if there were any suspicious looking white men around. <laughs> About this time, a gentleman came into town who had been a friend to some fugitives who were in Pittsfield. He inquired among the people if such persons were here. An elderly colored man and his wife were cooking at the old Berkshire Hotel, of whom this white stranger inquired if he knew such persons. The old man became alarmed and started on the double quick for my residence. He told me that a slave hunter was in town. I told him I would come up to town immediately. Up I went, and the man was shown me by the old cook. I went up to him and informed him that the impression among some of the colored people was that he was a slave hunter. The first thing I wanted to know was whether he was prepared to die, for only such men ought to engage in such work. <laughs> he immediately raised his hat from his head and asked whether he looked like a Negro hunter. I at once discovered that it was no less a personage than Lewis Tappan, Esquire, the patriot and philanthropist, and we shook hands and had a hearty laugh over it. So Lewis Tappan was well known as uh, an abolition and a uh, uh, person who was helping uh, slaves. <coughs> helping slaves to escape. Now, since you're talking about Pittsfield of today, it's far in advance of what Pittsfield was 25 years ago. The spirit of enterprise abounds on all hands. Then there were a few schoolhouses, enough for the demands of that day. But with the increase of population, more and larger and better schools were demanded, and we have them. The buildings, which were low, and the rooms all on the ground floor have been raised, and additional rooms and the number of teachers increased, and all over the village are these to be seen. And the grand effort is to secure to native and adopted citizens the advantages of a common school education. Ignorance is, diff is dangerous to a Republican form of government. Every man in this country and under this government is a sovereign, and the aim is to have a government based upon the intelligence of the people. Had the masses of the Southern people been blessed with the advantages of the common school as they are here in Massachusetts, the Civil War, which destroyed so many lives and which caused such a vast expenditure of treasure, never could have occurred. They would have banished slavery from their midst of their own will, and there would have been no cause for war. But the ignorance of the masses was the cause of their being led into war by their leaders, and they fought with a bravery worthy of a better cause. The New England public schools foster intelligence among the masses. Then another thing which has an influence is the open Bible in these schools without note or comment. The Bible has had a mighty power in shaping the morals of the people, and its influence has been restraining. I have no sympathy with that sentiment which says out with the Bible from our public schools, because there is a party who are opposed to the Bible being read. The Bible has made our nation what it is today, and its influence enters into the very warp and woof of our political system. The men who embarked in the Mayflower 250 years ago came with the Bible, and our republicanism received its life and vitality from those men. They laid the foundation of our system upon the Bible. The system which they introduced was inimical to slavery. Consequently, that system was short-lived in this state and the few slaves petitioned for their own emancipation. So there's this publication called A Centennial Sermon, and he delivered it at the Methodist Episcopal Church in Pittsfield on July 2nd, 1876. 
And I think you'll be interested in some of the things he has to say here. That immortal document, the Declaration of Independence, which struck the keynote that gave the American Revolution such significance, aroused the sympathies of the oppressed nations of the earth and brought forth men and money to aid, to aid in the struggle for a new nation's life and continued existence. Adams and Hancock and their compatriots knew not whereunto their efforts would grow. But with a faith remarkable and a courage sublime, they launched their bark upon the billows and waves of the revolution. And after seven years of storm and hail of the battlefield, she was borne through and moored so far as human observation was concerned. But the, men was, but the end was not accomplished alone by the so-called white American, but representatives from various nationalities and the race which I am proud to represent bore a conspicuous part in that noble conflict with British veterans. For be it remembered that there were numbers of colored people in all the colonies before the revolution was thought of, and they were not less patriotic than the men of a fairer hue, and they performed various services in the colonial army. Some are very glib about this being a white man's government, but the blood of the colored man flowed freely in the revolutionary contest. History says the first bloodshed in Boston was that of a colored man, and there are documents which can be had and which contain the commendations of the commander-in-chief of the American forces, George Washington, of the faithful services and bravery of the colored soldiery of the revolution. And the man who talks of this being a, quote, white man's government, unquote, I really pity for his ignorance. He has little knowledge of the past history of the government under which he lives, and he had better read what men of other days have said in times which have tried men's souls. Now another excerpt. The Republic is yet on trial and will be until it becomes a fixed fat, fact that Republican institutions are more conducive to the well-being of the many than of the few. And now you're going to read something, I'm going to read something that sounds exactly like today. For our danger lies in this, that men of no character and great ambition have ample opportunity for rising to the highest position in the land. <laughs> if they can carry the populace with them, then the object of their ambition is accomplished whether through a Republican or Democratic party. For there is a charm in the name of democracy by which many are beguiled and allured. For it is a patent fact that in the name of democracy in this country, great wrongs have been perpetrated of which any reasonably intelligent man must be ashamed. Now another excerpt here. Anyone who knows anything about the convention which formed the federal constitution knows that it was a matter of long and acrimonious debate whether the word slave should be inserted in the American constitution. And it was not done clearly and explicitly for it would have been contradictory of the sentiments of the Declaration of Independence, which is an older document than the constitution and are the immortal utterances of Thomas Jefferson whom modern democracy falsely claim as its proudest leader and founder. The leaders of that day could not stultify their conscience in that way. It is only left to men of a later day to pronounce against the utterance of those men who appeal to the world for sympathy in their struggles to found an empire of free states where the oppressed of all nations may find retreat and shelter from the despotisms of the old world. And I'm going to read another thing. This was called An Appeal of a Colored Man to His Fellow Citizens of a Fairer Hue in the United States. I like the way he says that, of a fairer hue. (laughs) 
Nowhere have an emancipated people been sent out so empty-handed as the freed people of the South. Their disloyal owners hold the land. The wealth which the rebels hold today is from the unrequited toil of the ex-slaves. And if the freed people of the South had their just dues, they would be the owners of every foot of land in the southern states. All the wealth of the South belongs to them really and truly. For the very year the Mayflower landed the Puritans upon Plymouth Rock, that same year a cargo of slaves was landed at Jamestown, Virginia, which is over 250 years ago. All these long years they have toiled for the benefit of others, and when emancipated, not a foot of land was donated to them that they might call their own. And even intelligence and the sources from which intelligence comes are denied them. And even in some places of the South, schools which are built by Northern charity for them have been destroyed by the touch of the incendiary. The old hate of the past in relation to the education of the colored man of the South is today shown in no small degree. And in reference to it, the pulpit and press are silent. Politicians seemingly dare not denounce it because its victims are colored people, while at the same time professedly good men are rolling up their eyes in holy horror at the Turks because of the outrages which they are perpetrating against Christians in the Eastern world. But in relation to the cruelties which have been enacted against the defenseless colored people of the South, there is no united and decided protest from northern pulpits or from northern politicians. This silence may be interpreted to mean this, that it is no crime or is not one of sufficient magnitude to demand northern protest. But were the victims of a fairer hue and those who are guilty of these outrages colored men, there would come a united protestation from every northern state and the arm of the general government would at once be employed to visit condign punishment upon the party guilty of such crimes. It is not enough for us to be moral and religious, but also industrious and economical. There are thousands over the land who are all that can be asked of them to be, while many others are the opposite in character and conduct. We are justified, we are misjudged by very many of our white fellow citizens, or they occupy a wrong standpoint from which they judge us. For the misdemeanor of a few, they judge the many and condemn the many for the misdeeds of the few. We are not judged as other communities are. The misdeeds of the few are not attributed to the many. For example, take New England. If in any town there would be a few hundred colored people and a small portion of the number are idle and vicious and thieving, all are liable to be judged by the misdeeds of the few. It is not so among our white fellow citizens. All are not judged for the misdeeds of the others. This, anyone who is fair-minded, known to be wrong, but is the wrong under which our people are continually resting. And I have um, one more. <coughs> But it is necessary that this find a practical expression. He's talking about the status, about the American Constitution. Necessary to find a practical expression by the people of this great republic. The chief executive of the nation, we believe, is right in the subject, and the legislature and the judiciary, we believe, are right. But the grand object is to get the individual citizen right. And to this point, we would call the attention of those to whom we are speaking. Laws, however favorable to any project they may be, if there is no public sentiment favorable, will be of no avail. Public sentiment heretofore had been against us, and even now is really so. The massacre at the South, proscription at the North, this must all be changed. The interest of the one race, if I may say so, if I may so speak, is the interest of the other. We are of one language, and the same system of laws are essential to govern both. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I am running into a new year, 
and the old years blow back like a wind that I catch in my hair, like strong fingers, like all my old promises, and it will be hard to let go of what I said to myself about myself when I was 16 and 26 and 36 and even 76. But I am running into a new year and I beg what I love and I leave to forgive me. That was Lucille Clifton. Thank you. It wasn't the Forsythia banging its yellow drum along the stone wall. Not the grass speaking its language of new green loud enough to bring tears to my eyes. Not the buds on the Japanese quince promising the next warm day. No, it wasn't. On a branch was a bird whose delicate color confused me. So when you said it was a lady cardinal, I was surprised, thinking she'd be more exotic, worth some excitement. After you went back in, I saw the mail. He must have been there all along. It was the way he was watching her. I remember that look.